Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all. I'm just recovering from my fear of uh, Robert not making it. <laughs> but he's, he's shown up just in time. And I'm deeply honored to introduce Robert Augustus Masters to you. He's, along with uh, Lawrence Heller, who's also in the conference, he's, it's between those two who I think has got the deepest sense of the human psyche I've ever come across. And I've, yeah, experienced amazing work with Robert. He's an integral psychotherapist with a doctorate in psychology, relationship expert and psycho-spiritual teacher and trainer, whose work intuitively blends the psychological and physical emotional with the spiritual. He's the author of many leading edge books, including Spiritual Bypassing, To Be a Man and Transformation Through Intimacy. And I am John Thompson, the co-founder of Circling Europe and the host of this conference. And I will now hand over to Robert. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad to be here. And you know, John, I didn't say this earlier, but I'd, I'd like this to this just be a free flowing conversation. We'll, we'll touch on everything that needs to be touched on. So you can ask me questions, whatever, because I, my topic is intimacy, but intimacy is such a huge thing to consider. I think we came up with a title, uh, becoming intimate with all that we are. And that sounds nice on paper, but that actually means so much. It means we're going to move toward whatever in us is there, including what we don't like about ourselves, whatever's in our shadow, not to get rid of it, not to fuse with it, not to rehabilitate it in some way, but to become intimate with it, to know it really well without getting lost in it. There's no fusion. There's in, intimacy is not fusion. Many of us think intimacy and fusion are the same thing. We become one with the other person, profoundly connected, uh, etc. But we lose a sense of, of the subtle space we need between us and the other, be it a person or a state that allows us to keep our focus clear. So if I'm working with my fear, I get too close to what I can get lost in. Too far away from it, I don't get the details I need. Intimate with it means that I'm up close to it, but I'm not lost in it. This, this, doing this also allows us to transcend, fully transcend codependency in relationship. Okay, that's my opening. I would like to invite you to talk a bit about transformational intimacy. That's the way that I've introduced this context is the way that we can genuinely use every relationship as a crucible for our growth. Yeah, and I'd say a crucible slash sanctuary. If it's too much right. crucible, we, we, get, we, we get a little antsy, it's difficult, we can bur get burned up. Somebody's just too much for us. Not every, all of us can dive into the deep end of the pool right away. We need some gradual progression sometimes toward that. So transformation through intimacy to me means here's a crucible and a sanctuary for relationship. And that sounds great on paper again, but it, it, it takes a lot. Uh, so few couples move in this direction because of what it asks of them. It asks for complete vulnerability, transparency, and trust. In fact, enough trust in your partner that you can openly share your mistrust when it arises. You can openly share whatever you dreamt about, whatever's in the shadow, and it's not necessarily gonna be easy. If it's easy, it's not your edge. So you're playing on the edge in a relationship like that. If it uh, doesn't shake you it's, to some degree, it's not your edge. If it doesn't scare you, it's not your edge. And in this sense, it's nothing wrong with being afraid. I mean, fear is part of our condition. So especially in this time of COVID, it's like, hey, here's this pandemic of fear infecting a lot of us or most of us. We have a chance like never before to f face our fear, not like some naive hero, but to actually approach it and become intimate with it to know it inside out. So if you're in an intimate relationship, you start to get scared at a certain point, you wonder, is she really the right one for me? And I don't like this, I don't like that. Instead of letting that take you down, you go, okay, this is edgy, I gotta share this. But in a way that honors the other person's ability to receive it. So it's always about relationship. Like whatever you and I do with others has an impact. 
if we're not taking responsibility for our part in that impact, we're leaving something out. We can assume an arrogance in that as if we're saying, uh, whatever I say, it's just me be telling my truth. And if you have a bad response to it or get upset by it, that's your stuff. That's a naive approach. It was true back in the 70s and 80s in the counter groups, but now I think we're more evolved than that. We don't have to go there. We still can be firm, powerful, centered, and compassionately, empathetically present with the other person. Sometimes someone's edge is simply to raise their voice a tiny, tiny bit. Sometimes a person's edge is to get out of bed in the morning. Other times it can be more, more dynamic looking, incredible, spectacular, but it's still an edge. And an intimate relationship, we're always playing our edge. I have that with my wife, Diane. It's not like we're on edge all the time, hardly at all. There's an ease, there's a comfort, but there's permission, full mutual permission to go there. And then intimacy becomes the path, not just for a relationship, but for life. Like if I, my spiritual path in a nutshell would be to become intimate as possible with all that I am, including my mortality, my death. I've been close to death many times, so that's part of my daily meditation. It's not morbid. It actually makes me feel better to tune into that. Even if I am your grandfather, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> There's also so many ages in me. You seem to light up speaking about that just then. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear more on, on that theme. <laughs> Well, if, we're, if our, our, our entire Western culture is death phobic, for a lot of us, people don't die. They pass on, they pass away, they make a trend, they're making a transition. We're still afraid of facing death head on, not naively, but really to inti become intimate with it. So when I, I'm in meditation, and other times I like to tune into the my mortality, not by thinking about it. I want to feel it in my bones. And that, that, that can be done. And each of us has our own unique way of, of, of aligning with this. But I found that avoiding death deadens us. Avoiding death deadens us. Many of us die before we die, not in that high spiritual sense. We just kind of give up. We go flat. We have the perks of life and we just kind of fade away. Or we try and be young. We try and, you know, break our world track and field master's record when we're 80 in the discus or the 100 meters or something. We're still trying to be artificially young and not accepting the seasons. Like, I like seasons. I've earned my wrinkles. Diana's earned her wrinkles. There's something about that. It's, 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 it's liberating. And there's a decline physically, but it doesn't mean there's a decline in other ways. There's more space, more presence. And I, I almost died in 2016 from a heart attack. I kept like, you know that. I had five minutes left to live. The ambulance got there miraculously quickly in three or four minutes, and I'm here. But I was gone. There was no, no, nothing I could do to stay alive, no meditative technique, nothing. I was going down. And after that, I had this deep in my bone sense that this is bonus time for me. Every time I do a group, you know, so you guys, all my groups I've done, it's like I may never do another one. And I know that it's not more, but again, it's not more, but it's like, well, okay, this makes it even more precious. I want to give it my best and take care of myself at the same time. And that awareness, my awareness of death was profoundly deepened by that. And I came out of it very, very grateful to be here. Even when I'm having a shitty day, things aren't going well. I still have that background sense. I'm here. Is wonderful and it sucks sometimes but it doesn't matter that it sucks mm -hmm. i want that to be able to get bottled up and kind of shared out to people it, it seems such a foundational um, having that at your base seems like the most resourcing an or like orienting approach to life you could have. Yeah. I mean, think of the huge events, birth, death, and then there's this brief flash of color and drama in between we call our life, which can be as goes by so fast. We have a chance to really evolve during that time or we can not evolve. But I think at the time of death, this one sad thing is many people are not prepared for their death. Suddenly it's there. 
and it's, there's no, no time to pull it together, take care of business. We're just going down the tubes. And even if our death is quick, if we prepared for it, like when Gandhi died, he said, Ram, Ram, twice. And he said he was gone as Hindi for God. He'd practice, so he was able to tune in and remember God, however slightly, at this very moment when, they, when he was about to die. He's on the edge. And we can practice. Dalai Lama was asked when he was 50, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? He said, prepare for my death. He was happy saying it. Here it is. And most of us are not preparing. We think we have time. We'll pull it together at the end. We'll do some incredible practice, and we'll, we'll be prepared to enter that incredible event. It's still a mystery. The world of religions, no one, no one agrees. There's no great full consensus on what happens after death. It just isn't. So for me, I don't have a set belief about it. I just have a sense this is mystery. And then what happens after death is happening right now, right now. It's the same, it's the same mystery, same requirements, the same opportunity. Impacted, touched. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. So when I go into a group, I have a very quick prayer I often say, which is, may I be compassionate, loving, present, patient, and be operating at an optimal skill level throughout this group or session or whatever. And I can add to that too, also in touch with my mortality. So I bring that into every group I do now, every group at the right time. And it's almost invariably received in the way that it deepens people, has them envision their own dying, how they'd like to die. Also knowing that you may not get your wish, who knows how it's going to be. And I had, I share that with my partner, my wife, Diane, we're, we're unusually close. We know that one of us dies. The other one's going to be completely devastated, but there's no plan B. I made a choice when I was with her, began with her, her with me to have no exit plan, zero, zero which made me more vulnerable, but it also made the love deeper and richer. It still does. So I think that's part of the whole path of, of transformation through intimacy is, is to have one's mortality in mind, heart, body. And not, not to throw that out the window because you're feeling reactive or you don't like her this day or one of you smells bad or whatever, just all the little things that couples endure and often don't deal with very skillfully. And also honoring this body. I mean, I'm still very fit for my age, but I mean, I, I go to the gym now. I don't, I don't go for the big weights. I do my yoga more slowly. And I don't bewail the fact that I can't do things I did. I, I used to be a runner, an athlete. If I run for five minutes, now my knees hurt. So instead of trying to push through it, okay, I get to walk. Thank God I can walk. And I can walk fast sometimes. There's all these, it's such a, a shifting of values. Like we're all feeling during the COVID time too. I have many people are complaining about that being alone, they're bored. What a chance to get to know boredom. What a chance to, to deepen your internal process, your internal work, even if you take care of business externally. So uh, um, I'm following the thread a little bit. There's a lot of people chatting and oh. really appreciating what, what you're saying and appreciating you. Um, someone said, please, can you share more about how you can play edges with people? Well, first of all, you play your own edge. If you're not playing your own edge, then it's, it's, it doesn't come, you don't come across as authentic as you would otherwise. If you're, if you're simply sitting back saying wise things, your own edge has to be part, you know that from your work, John. Your own work has to be part of the process. Then you bring to that, if you're talking about working with anger at a deep level or fear, and you've already been doing that, you're doing that yourself, that makes you far more reliable as a guide and a facilitator. It's that surrendered leadership we talked about, is there's this, that, that. And each person's edge, as I said earlier, has to be respected. I mean, some people, 
again, I've had people in groups often say, oh, I wish I could do that. You know, someone else just had a huge catharsis, big breakthrough, worked with their birth or something, primal work, and I'm doing the body work. It's magical. And they're going, well, what do I have? I just, you know, feel kind of dull and ordinary. So I will not try and have them go into the same zone as the last person. I'll have them say, here's their edge. And we'll find it together, together. Then we work with it in a way that doesn't push them too far, but still pushes a little bit. It's not just passively nodding your head at the person, whatever they say. You're holding space and taking action at the very same time, which is a powerful thing. Not to just either hold space or take action and do both at the same time. And that's why I do smaller and smaller groups. My groups have been dropped down to eight people per group. Now with Zoom, I'm only doing six people per group. I found that's the most effective number. I can give everyone lots of time to work again and again, lots of focus. That's out of respect for what people need and knowing that, yeah, if I had 20 people, I could do, do good work with that group, but some people will be left out. So again, it's an attunement to what, what is the other capable of and where's their edge? And you may test it a little bit and back up. I, I'm always self-correcting. I go a little far in one area. Okay, it doesn't quite work. Back up, come at it again. But it's all spontaneous, intuitive. There's no rehearsal, zero rehearsal. And implicit in that is becoming intimate with that person's state. So if they're a little bored or they're kind of numb, I'm, I, get, I access my curiosity about what's going on. What's, what's boredom feel like? Where do you sense it in your body? How does it feel different in your small of your back and in the back of your heart? So we're looking at boredom together. We're looking at things that are seemingly this far from glamorous. Now, every, and everything becomes part of the as on the menu, everything. And that creates an inherent safety in the other person or the group because the, you're not walking in with a pre-set methodology where everyone has to fit to that. Instead, you're letting people emer emerge in their own way and you're working with it skillfully, compassionately and not aiming for perfectionism in any sense whatsoever. And also not excusing yourself when you get messy, you get a little sloppy and you clean it up pretty fast. So I'm kind of talking from the inside. I didn't expect this in this interview, but the inside of um, what it is to work where there's no... Um, preset methodology. You're letting your, yourself be guided by the moment to moment needs, seen and unseen, spoken and unspoken of the people you're working with. So you're in a way you're being a leader, being a firm leader, a strong leader, a good captain, but you're also being led by their needs. So you're not like just this hard nosed, hard shelled character. You're actually very receptive. You're soft, but you still have a spine. It, it reminds me, I think I heard a podcast of you about eight or nine years ago talking about that exact thing. And I was just like, wow, that feels so alive. Mm -hmm. and like, what a way to work. And then it was probably four or five years after that that we started doing Surrendered Leadership, which felt like that. It's like there's nowhere to hide, even though we're leading and like we're in that radical embrace of the intimacy of what's here. Yeah. And even implicit in that, you can also honor your, your desire to hide. But you bring it up right. in the workers, you're not hiding your <laughs> desire to hide. Exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's the liberating. I hear that as a very liberating thing that you're bringing, like intimacy in all that we are. There's never a thing that can be there that we can't then become more intimate with. Yeah, and I, I know I've often said to people, don't settle for oneness, go for intimacy. Of course, oneness is there, but when we settle for that, we don't honor our full, full individuality. We can get caught up in non-dual realms. We make a, a we deify those realms and like that. That's it. We've arrived. And I used to have that when I was younger, but now I have no sense there's some final arrival. It's more like it's endless discovery. Mystery goes the closer you get to it, the deeper it is. Just like love, you can love your partner profoundly, and you know that there's no bottom to it. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That many of us are infected by the I have arrived virus. I've arrived. We can get stuck in that so easily.
do you have a sense of, of the 320 people that you're speaking to? Or is it, I want to make sure you know the environment you're in. I can kind of feel, I can feel them through you. I can feel you, you're very easy to read emotionally and you're a very beautiful, sensitive man. I can, I can feel that. So we're happy. This is like a, this is like an unrehearsed, spontaneous conversation. Don't don't know where it's going to go, but it feels feels good. You're such a receptive listener. You're looking. Are you still looking at the comments? Yeah, bit by bit. I could li listen forever to this wise man. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what I need to let go of in order to be able to love so deeply. You have to enact, I would answer that person saying you have to get more intimate with the part of you that doesn't want to love that deeply, that actually fears it. Most of us have a place in this that we're afraid of intimacy. Instead of shaming ourselves for that, we go, okay, I want to meet that place in me that doesn't, is afraid of deep intimacy. And for a lot of men, it's a bit like there's the imagery of the sperm hitting the ovum and disappearing. I can get lost in it. I'll lose my control. And yet that's the whole point. <laughs> Could you say a little more about differentiating intimacy versus fusion? Yes. Yeah. It's good to know the difference because in typical romantic love, we swoon or we have this rush like I've known this person forever. You should have it a sense because they remind you at a very deep cellular level, the parent that dominated you or you had the most charge with. But the oneness, here's the image I have. Two people sitting so face each other the romantic couple and they've lost their boundaries. So if you and I are that couple, there's a swoon. I just hold my boundaries dissolve, yours dissolve. And we've, we've rushed together in this sense of oneness, but we don't have any boundaries without boundaries. We can't differentiate. We can't evolve. We have nothing to integrate. We're just, we're stuck in this bubble. And when reality comes along and pricks that bubble, we act like it's a devastatingly horrible thing, but actually it's, it's, a, it's an awakening. It's a rude awakening, but it's an awakening. And in intimacy, we always have some degree of separation in a healthy sense from the other. We may, so in the imagery of the couple again, it'd be as if the, each person expands their boundaries to include the other. So I would expand my boundaries to include you. And it can bring about a profound connection and closeness, but I still haven't lost touch with me. And my boundaries could even expand infinitely, but they're still being expanded. So we're creating a circle. In the circle of my being, there's room for me and you and others. And that allows me to maintain my integrity as a separate being, even as I become more intimate with the dimensions of self that are transcend the usual. And that, the personal, interpersonal, and relational all work together without one being favored over the other. Many spiritual paths, for example, favor the spiritual or transpersonal over the personal. I mean, something's missed then. We're bypassing our humanity. Getting away from the messiness of it and the pain. We're not here to just wallow in pain, but we're here to treat our pain not as an enemy, but this is something to explore. And you, <coughs> you can't explore it if you don't lean into it, turn toward it. And that's the essence of, again, healthy intimacy in a couple, transformation through intimacy, is nothing gets left off the table. And invariably, pain arises. It could be a conflict, or one person's got some illness, something's happened, and we turn toward the pain. It doesn't go away, necessarily, but we're just no longer an issue in the same way. Hmm. And there's a freedom in that. It's like sitting in a meditation retreat, like I remember doing it in India a long time ago, and there's mosquitoes everywhere. I mean, I could spend my whole time scratching and itching or just let them have their way, which I ended up doing. Okay, go ahead, feed you guys. Have a feed, and I can't stand it. This sucks. And I'm sweating. <laughs> there's like the blood here and there. I'm <laughs> okay. And that didn't come instantly, but it became after a while. Okay, this is what I can do with this. Rather than retreating or quitting or covering myself up and too many layers of clothing and sweating even more. 
there's something about facing the, the discomfort. So we get addicted in our culture to being comfortable. And I like my comforts just like anyone else, but there's a sense when it's not comfortable, can I generate comfort with that discomfort? Can I learn to have a bad day well? Yeah, we can. How are you doing now? I'm good. You? Yeah, really, really good. I'm, I could listen to you speak like this for a long time and tracking a little bit what's in the chat as well. Yeah, I've been nicely on my edge during this process. That's what you've been talking about. It's been fitting nicely. Well, that's a big thing, you know, to, to sense what our edge is, approach it with some respect, not going too fast or too slow, and and having a vow internally to to work this edge a bit more, to be with it. Many people try and do too much, and of course they rebound, and they give up, and say, oh, it's too hard for me. I think it's important to turn toward what we're uncomfortable with or having a, it's challenging and turn in a way that doesn't over just that respects our need, the pace we need to have. Like you may be quicker to recover from reactivities than say your partner, but even so you can have respect for her doing it, but going at a pace that works for her, which is different than not doing it at all or going way too slow, so way slower than we can. And we are, we are at an edge as a species too. It's good to let ourselves feel that. Here's our personal fear. Here's our collective fear. And we all feel it. And if you don't attune to that, you'll not be very aware of its impact on you. You know, the message of the news, which is basically we are threatened. And yet when you, we go into the collective fear, what I've seen happen again and again is it, it brings us closer to our grief. We start to feel some compassion for others that are like us, but suffering more. We feel their fear and ours, and that often cracks the heart open to where we actually really can feel people in a big sense. We don't have to know their names or even what they look like, but we feel it. And it's not intellectual, it's in the heart. And that brings us into a collective grief where we can look at what's, what we've done with our ecologically, politically, and all the other ways. We can look at what's happening and what's being emphasized through the crisis we're in, the COVID and the, the fear pandemic that's arising and work with it. And we can practice this in, the, in, the, in, in our own relationships with our partner, kids, people we're, we we're, have good bonds with. Someone's asked what intimacy means to you. I don't, I don't even know how to answer that because it doesn't mean, I don't have a sense of being of some sort of meaning, but I, I, if I look at the question more deeply, it's um, absolutely central to me. It, to me, it's foundational. Like this foundational, in the same sense of turning toward our pain is foundational. Intimacy is uh, foundational. And so does working with shadow. I have a sense that, you know, if we don't work with our shadow, we invariably are going to be run by what's in it. And I think shadow work at its core is absolutely essential now. Not a study of Jungian architecture. It's not about where it goes down to the core where shadow is the storehouse for our unresolved, unilluminated, un unworked with conditioning. It's all sitting there. And it's sitting there because we don't want to go near it because it's uncomfortable, it's painful. But it's sitting there. So those are all foundational. Intimacy is at the core of it. I mean, what's spirituality? Because you could call that intimacy, cultivation of intimacy with what we take to be sacred. Totally, truly sacred. You could have that going if you're an atheist, or you could be a devout follower of a certain path, spiritual path.
I absolutely love everything this man is speaking. How to build intimacy with ourselves. That means building it with very small things, especially when you feel like something's happening, it doesn't feel like it really honors you, weakens you, like some boredom, some laziness, some hesitation to do something you know you need to do. See, implicit in that too is compassion for ourselves. Otherwise, we can get too hard on ourselves. You know, like I've done all this work in myself, I shouldn't be having this happen. How can I be still being reactive with my children or my partner? Because you're human. The thing is, this is not about perfection, it's about making friends with the messiness, cleaning it up. Another question, can you say something on relational developmental trauma? Yeah, pay attention to it. And many relationships don't have to give enough focus to the, each partner's um, unresolved history, pain, trauma. That trauma can come in in so many ways. It doesn't mean the other person's become a therapist and work with it. Be aware of when that kicks in. Like when you suddenly feel like you're a five-year-old boy again, or you're three years old, or you're eight, some, and it's there, and you're speaking, you're letting it dominate you, even as you use your adult rational capacity to articulate it. It's really good for both partners to know each other's history really, really well. Not to say, oh, that's just your story, which is a real shamey put down. It's more like, here's, here's what my history. And it may never shift, but I can shift my relationship to my history. So it doesn't dominate me. Another question, would, would love to hear you speak about jealousy. Well, first of all, jealousy is inevitable. I mean, there's a, there's a healthy jealousy, there's an unhealthy jealousy. But I mean, when it arises, if you can name it, here's the one of the things that seems, sounds so simple, but it's so crucial, name it. Ah, uh, jealousy, a uh, fear, anger. It may feel awful, but you name it. Once you name it, you create a very subtle separation from that state. You still overcome with the jealousy and the heart stabbing pain of it, but you're not completely lost in it. And if you're really close with a partner, and for some bizarre reason, whatever, they betray you, of course that's going to hurt. Especially if they get involved with someone else in a way that's really sloppy, behind your back. That really hurts. If it doesn't hurt, it means you're numb. Of course it hurts. So the key with jealousy, working with jealousy, is to get in touch with the younger parts of yourself that are especially hit hard by it. And it takes you back through your life to original betrayal with a parent, sibling, teachers. And also when someone betrays you, they've, they've broken the trust. I see so many couples that are trying to make it work and one of them has betrayed the other. And the one that's been betrayed is trying really hard often to make it work, hang in there, forgive, but they don't trust, nor should they. It takes, unless the other does great work on himself or herself and becomes trustworthy, truly trustworthy. Even then it takes time. But jealousy is just one of the many emotions. It's really worth, like with all the emotions, how to become more intimate with them, study them, get to know them. If you or I are jealous, there's a certain sensations in our body, there's certain characteristics, like with shame. I see people in groups that are, have shame. You know, the, the eyes drop, the body sags. There's all the telltale signs. You just can see it in dogs too, not just humans. Cringing. <laughs> And I often am teaching people, especially men in the groups I'm doing, to sit, sit with dignity in the midst of the fire of their shame. To not let the shame reduce them to just simply groveling and beating themselves up with guilt, flagellating themselves, in case they're not available to the other at all. But letting shame be there and saying, what is shame? If I stay with shame, what happens? What happens is quite beautiful. It, it shifts quickly. You're moved to make amends, your conscience kicks in. But many of us, especially us men, we feel shame. We convert it instantly to aggression or withdrawal. So we don't look like we have shame, we're just angry, we're aggressive. Someone criticizes us and we attack back, like a lot of political leaders do. Can you speak more? Sorry? I was just thinking, as I said that, how. This, this applies in so many areas. I mean, there's, we can look at our relationship, our emotions, 
And this, the same thing applies. Are we connected to that? Or are we simply reacting to it or lost in it? And to me, being really conscious, this doesn't mean you become like a, you're aware of every breath you take. You can say, if someone asks you, what did you awake, when you woke up this morning, did you wake up on an inhale or exhale? Sounds great. But I mean, that's, that's extreme devotion to a certain practice. And we have the capacity, John, to be present with all of this. I mean, including our mortality. I'm, I'm still loving the presence I feel, listening to you, the depth, mm -hmm. very touched in my heart. Yeah. Warm. Yeah. <laughs> Can you speak? more to balancing having a crucible and a sanctuary within the relationship. Cultivate both from the beginning. Like you want the sanctuary is crucial. Everyone wants a sanctuary, that comfort. Like I'm really at home here. This is, oh, this is so safe. And that needs to be developed alongside the crucible. And the crucible doesn't require you leap into the fire fully right off the bat. You, you, you open to it quite soon. Like you're starting a new relationship you're not overriding the red flags because it feels so good to be with him or her. Wow, this is incredible. The red flags are still there. Pay attention to them. You may still go ahead, even though that's there, but pay attention. And I'll invite that material into the crucible so it can be looked at. Don't override it. Somebody's bothering you about your partner and it could last for a couple of days. Don't assume, oh, it's probably just me. Bring it up. And when it's a crucible and a sanctuary, it means that means that the relationship itself is a safe container. There's no leaks. And then, and then if we have an urge to leak energy a little bit, get a little bit erotically pulled somewhere else when we're already with a fully committed partnership, bring it up, look at it. It may shake the relationship up, but sometimes relationships need to be shaken up. Good ones, there are waves, there are waves that disturb things, but they're not over, it's not overly done. Oh, I see a question. Do we always bring it up with our partner? Is that was that one? Wow. I'd say no. Don't 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 have a preset program. Sometimes you don't bring it up because the other person's not ready to deal with it, or there's too much stress already, or there's you've had a really rough day. But be open to bringing it up and then ask, is this going to serve us to do this right now? Maybe you, you delay it to, for a day or a short time. So you're more centered when you bring it up. It's an art. Not like there's a five easy steps and this will make our relationship be incredible. It's more like, okay, it's an art. It's messy and you learn in it. How to be with fear. That's a huge, that's, see, that's a beautiful question because if it's asked sincerely, there's, a, there's a sense of everyone has fear. And uh, I would say in general, start cultivating intimacy with it or even simpler, turn toward it just a little bit at a time. Worry and anxiety, okay. Dread more difficult, terror, of course, much more difficult, but to turn toward it and notice its locale in your body. And if I'm noticing my fear, there's a, there almost always is an expansion of myself. It's not deliberate, but it happens. The more I expand with my fear, I give it more room to be, and it becomes less central. It decentralizes the fear. And then my work, in a nutshell, is I'm getting inside my fear, then inside fear itself. And if it goes away, great. If it doesn't go away, no big deal. It's just there. It's energy. It's contraction. So we, we start to move toward it. So the, the, the old Tibetan Buddhist would call inviting the demons in for tea. So we're, invi we're inviting those, that element, that fearful element into our living room, so to speak. And it doesn't mean we're calm when we do. It may be shaking. We could be really feeling bad, but we start the process. 
then that allows the fear to mutate. It may turn into anger. You're just really pissed about something. You're no longer contracted. You're angry for better or for worse. Or you start to you feel sadness. You feel grief. The good news here is that it's all workable. Maybe not in a split second, but it's workable. That's one of the miracles of our incarnation here is we have that capacity to work with so many things. What's that? Two more, people. more on shadow, please. Okay. <laughs> Work with shadow, please. I mean, to me, don't treat it as 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 an absolutely essential part of your your work on yourself, not something you look at now and then, the sideline pursuit. It's not intellectual study. It's, it's visceral. It's profound. Real shadow work is messy. It's primal. It just means that you're contacting what you've tried to stay away from for most of your life. You're making contact with it, and it has something to say to you. Of course, you have something to say to it, too. You don't have to cave into it, but get into it with your shadow. I mean, I, I could underline that a thousand times. I have a new book out called Bringing Your Shadow Out of the Dark. And, of course, from Sounds True, I did um, called Knowing Your Shadow. I think shadow work is absolutely central. Absolutely central. I feel uh, mid experience with that right now. From running this conference, there's all kinds of energies coming up in me. And when you first spoke about it, then I had this rumble in my belly. And there's this sense of where I've like numbed my stomach in many ways. And now it's, I'm getting the chance during this intense em environment. Numbed yourself. To into it more. Numbed yourself too. A ton of heat. <laughs> Enjoyable heat or uncomfortable heat. Enjoyable. It's really yeah. intense. <laughs> You're aware of it. It's there. Plus, there's a lot of responsibility, right? You've set up this this uh, conference, whatever, and you're you know a certain requirement. And you've got energy for it. Yeah. So you didn't, you didn't try and get away from the heat, trying to oh, I'll calm myself down here. I'll get re-centered again so I can focus on Robert a little more. No, it's just there. I also can see you're moved by different things uh, we've ta been talking about. And it's lovely because, I mean, you're, you're emotionally very fluid and nuanced. So it makes me, it makes my flow even easier to step into. So even, even though we're, you're, we're online, Zoom, you're in Europe, I'm in Oregon, we're connected. And it's not as easy. I also can, I also am enjoying letting my eyes drop down periodically and seeing the, the comments. I see the first five or six words. Yeah, it's special to be doing this in front of so many people. It's an honor. You know what, I'm having an intuition how to do a um, spontaneous guided meditation for everyone, as long as all, all the mics are off. And um, I think I'm going to dive in. It just feels right to do it. So everyone, please close your eyes. Eyes are closed and breathe deeper. And breathe through your mouth. and let your belly relax more so your belly gets softer with each exhale. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say some incomplete sentences. I want you to finish them out loud, finish them spontaneously, but don't repeat my part. Here we go. I'm feeling I wish I was. The sound of my voice feels.
when I get afraid, what I usually do is When I got afraid as a child, what I usually did was And when I feel fear, where I usually feel it in my body is imagine now your eyes are still shut you're breathing a little deeper you take your awareness you take your attention into that place in your body or places in your body where you feel fear it could be a little fear it could be a big fear it doesn't matter just imagine now you're moving a little closer to your fear just a little letting your belly stay soft so you're making more room for the fear to be in your your torso body limbs and imagine that that fearfulness in you is a very small child who happens to be you, who is you as a child. And approach this child very gently, but do keep moving forward. Here's a few more sentences to complete. As I move closer to this child in me who's scared right now, what I sense right away is and if I could say anything to the child in me right now, I'd say to him or her, and say it a little louder. And if that child could somehow speak back to me, he or she might say, now have a sense you're making more contact with this child, this place of fearfulness. And two things are starting to happen. One is love for that child, or compassion, some degree of that. And two, a sense of protecting that little one, coexisting, love and protection. Having a sense now of holding that child even closer, breathing deeper, allowing the feelings that this might cause to arise to become a little stronger, just a little. Having a sense of bringing more stillness and stability to the situation. Not trying to get away from the fear, not wanting to get away from the child because the child reminds you of what you don't want to feel, but just staying there, staying there. And now allowing your awareness to extend to others in this group we're having right now and outside the group, beyond the group, all over the planet who are fearful, afraid, perhaps more than you are. Feeling your breathing deep and as you expand to feel this, feeling some degree of compassion beginning when you've considered these others and then allowing even more of this. A few more sentences now. As I do this, with regard to others who are also afraid or more afraid than me, I start to feel and what I wish for all these other people all these other beings is
And what breaks my heart right now is And if my heart can somehow speak right now, it might say, now my fear is and my true nature is My whole body feels I am I am feeling more intimate with take a deep breath and let it go fully with some sound even deeper now a deeper inhale let it go with some sound feeling your whole body softening more spacious, sensing your heart having more room for your difficult states, including your fear. Open your eyes. See, the, the key to working with fear is to get inside it bit by bit. It's counterintuitive at first. We want to get away from it. We want to avoid the dragon, so to speak. But here it is. And the exploration of fear, like done like this, and a little more, is to, it deepens our love for what is. When we stop trying to escape our fear, I think we, when we work with it like this, our, our love gets even stronger. Love, our heart has room for fear, has room for all the shitty stuff, all the dark stuff, the difficult stuff. How are you doing, John? Great. <laughs> St still feeling the discomfort in my stomach, but feel in bliss at the same time. Isn't that interesting where you can feel that, that discomfort, that somewhat unpleasant, and there you are, you're feeling great otherwise, and, and you have room for that. And that will actually, you're not making a problem out of the fact there's something going on in your guts that maybe needs some exploration later. You know what else I want to say here is around relationship because we were on that topic earlier is when we get really close to another, it, it um, can feel wonderful, but it also can bring up stuff that we, we, don't want, we used to want to keep down and away because we have more safety now, more stuff can surface. People often think this means, oh, what's wrong with my relationship? I'll say, no, nothing. You're actually making, you're, you're becoming an environment where it's safer and safer to let this stuff surface, which means you're pretty close to him or her has deeper trust. So my deepest work in myself has come through my, my relationship with my wife, Diane, even though it's very easy, it's very peaceful, but there's such safety, whatever in me needs to be looked at, whether I want it or not, surfaces. And then 
we're, we end up gazing with mutual compassion upon this <clears throat> difficulty I'm having or she's having. That brings us even closer. So the arising of difficult stuff does not necessarily mean something's going wrong with the relationship, assuming there's no abuse externally. Time for one last question. Oh yeah. Someone that was asking about disgust, like what to do if you feel disgust towards someone. Or... Uh, the first thing I want to say is do not allow the disgust to dehumanize the other. See, to me, disgust is a natural emotion. We have it when we're little kids, you know, throwing out their food. We all have disgust. But when we let it go too far, when we say, for example, we allow disgust and aggression to coexist, uh, we'll have contempt. We'll have really dark states will arise. So if I'm feeling disgust for someone, I want to be clear, am I disgusted by them or by what they're doing? Almost always it's by what they're doing. And I may have to take action based on that, but I, I don't have no right to dehumanize them. The extreme of that is ethnic cleansing. We just feel so disgusted by the other, we dehumanize them, enslave them, treat them like shit. But disgust should not be vilified. I mean, disgust and compassion can coexist, just like anger and compassion can coexist, shame and compassion can coexist. All the basic emotions can coexist with compassion. And disgust is a primary emotion. So don't treat it as a bad thing but be very, very aware of where you want to take it. If you have to close your heart and what you're doing or dehumanize the other, it's better to just keep the disgust internal. Don't externalize it very much. Share it, but don't act it out. It's really important. Great harm, horrible things have been done by, from human to human because of disgust being mishandled. Just like when anger is mishandled, it can, great harm can come. It doesn't mean anger itself is bad, but it means it can be mishandled. So how to bring your disgust into your heart. We're, we're nearing, we're coming to the last few minutes. I wonder if there's anything you would like to speak to in, in closing. Well, cultivate as much intimacy as possible with all that you are. That's a huge thing. We just do a little bit at a time. It's not like a to-do list we're trying to tick off. It's an endless process of discovery. And it begins with noticing what I'm not intimate with in myself, don't want to be intimate with. Do something with that. And the, the core of that is turn toward what's uncomfortable, what's painful, just a little bit at a time. Not too much, not too little. And I want to say, John, it's been really lovely to have you be the in your position you're in right now, because your presence, your way you're listening to me, it just feels really good. It feels like we're actually in a group together. Yeah. And this is the warm up before I work with you. This is the warm up. <laughs> yeah, it's been a joy. And um, yeah. I'm still deeply touched by what you've shared and mm. imagining. Well, we can have a look at the chat to see how people are doing. It's a lot of love and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely, I see it. Yeah. And thank you for having me aboard. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. And allowing this to be a spontaneous conversation rather than me with some preset stuff. I can teach them about this, that, and the other. It was nice to wander all over the place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <sighs> Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Everyone's here. See you again in some form. Yeah, much love. I just want to add one thing I'm doing because of COVID. I've, I've retired from individual work um, five years ago. I've re -entered, I reopened that. I'm doing individual sessions again. And group, my groups are all on Zoom. So you know, my website is always you know, in-person stuff, but I'm actually doing individual work on Zoom and also starting men and women's groups again on Zoom. It's all there on my website. Can that go up? Uh, it did. Right. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Feel. Yeah. See ya. See you. And for everyone else.
coffee break time. If you uh, don't want to go into a 15 minute coffee break now, please leave. Uh,